All right, hi everybody. Uh, we are going to get started. Thank you so much for attending this webinar. So uh, this is the webinar that we've signed up for, how to talk to your youth about sex. We have Jonathan Levia. Uh, he works with Children's Aid in New York City. Uh, this is a little bit about PSS. We were founded in 1962 as an innovative multi-service agency, and we specifically work with older New Yorkers, their families, and communities to thrive. Uh, and PSS Life University offers educational and other programs online, and we have 10 local centers, um, all designed to keep and help older adults stay healthy, engaged, and connected. Uh, a little bit more about PSS. We work with folks who are caring for someone who's frail, chronically ill, or has memory loss. And this is the point of this webinar is families where a grandparent or a family member other than a parent is raising a grandchild. And so uh, through the kinship department, we have put on this webinar on to have those tough conversations with uh, the kinship youth that you're caring for. And our grandparent family apartment building is the first residence purposely built for grandparents raising grandchildren. A little bit of some of our other programs coming of age, uh, the 10 senior centers we run, and as of course, we welcome volunteers who serve an important role in delivering our services. Please type any questions or comments into the chat box. We'll respond to as many as we can. Uh, thank you again so much. And with that, I am going to turn it over to John. Awesome. Good morning, everyone. How's everyone doing? I'm gonna quickly share my screen. Uh, pardon. There we go. All right, can everyone see my screen now? Hey, John, I uh, think we're having a hard time hearing you. If you could just click unmute. Uh, can you hear me now? Hello? Hello? All right, can you hear me now? Yeah, John, I, I still can't hear you if um, you're speaking or not. If you could just check your mic. Hey, can you hear me now? Hello. My apologies. That was on me. I was muted on my speaker myself. Thank you so much, John. My apologies. <laughs> no worries. Can you hear me now? I can, and I am excited to hear more. Perfect. All right. Pardon. There we go. All right. So can everyone see my screen now? Perfect, so welcome to, awesome, perfect. So welcome to uh, the Parent Workshop, Adolescent Sex Education. So my name is, oh, give it a one second, sorry guys. Uh, okay, so my name is John, uh, or Jonathan Leba. Uh, I'm a health educator for the Children's Aid Society. I will be coming up on four years in September. Here are some, uh, some content that we actually produce uh, for our young adolescents. So just ask me, uh, just ask me sex is our, um, 
Instagram page that you guys can follow for more content that we will have uh, in the upcoming future. As far as um, future events, uh, we're actually planning one now, which is our youth summit. Um, so if our young adolescents would like to in, uh, uh, come and on board and to see how, you know, we do a couple things here, that would be uh, great information to just keep up with. Our um, CASHealthyTeens.org is a website that we have with all our information as far as two clinics that we have, one in Harlem and the other in the Bronx. Um, and we have a ton of information there as well. Um, if you ever guys, if you ever want to check us out. And also we have a YouTube channel, which is uh, the Children's Aid uh, Just Ask Me page. And we also upload that with uh, information about um, anything sex education related. Also, we have like our visual uh, presentation of our clinics. So uh, ground rules, um, we're gonna have, uh, well, we're gonna experience trust, right? Uh, trust that the, you know, what we say here uh, will express from, for everybody, not just myself, but with everyone else here. Um, Self-expression to the views of others, to the new options, to questioning of our own views, uh, listening uh, to everyone uh, with an open mind to our own self-expressions, and to have openness. Uh, one of the key things to talking to our young adolescents is having to have, is to be open-minded. Um, definitely to the to others views to our own opinions and to anything that we might be questioning um so really quickly um can we just say our names really quick and maybe one thing we might want to gain from this workshop If folks feel comfortable, they can just uh, type that into the webinar chat on the uh, right hand side. Yes, please. If you are feeling comfortable and you can uh, say it. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Learn to work. Okay. And hopefully we can do that today, um, just by building a, some confidence with knowledge, with information um, that we will take up today. Nice to meet you. Okay. Okay. Awesome. So I see a lot of similar views on, on how um, how we can talk to our youth. So it might it's not always easy to talk to the youth about a subject that some of us might not always feel very comfortable. Um, one second. Okay. Yeah. Um, I see that you have your, your hand raised. Oh, sorry, there you go. Oh.
Yes. Yeah, hi. I can I can hear you. You have your hand raised? Or do you want to type? Um, do you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. What are some of the different types that we can know to like uh, speak to your child? Like to speak to a child, especially a boy. Well, um, there's many different approaches, but one of the main approaches is to just know your information um, or know the information as correct as possible, um, which is what I'm going to start now. Um, <laughs> So that we so that we know some of these some of this information so we can deliver the correct information um, sometimes from what I've seen um, sometimes fear is something that is used um, to get this information across but, but the problem with that is that um, fear doesn't work okay um, knowing the correct information just having um, communication is definitely gonna it's gonna be key for delivering this type of information and also how comfortable you feel it's so it's okay if you're not comfortable with talking about certain things and maybe just looking things up together um but i'm gonna jump into the presentation do you have any other questions or no okay awesome So breaking the ice, uh, sex education uh, basics are maybe covered in the health class, uh, but your team may not hear it or understand it. Everything you need to know uh, to make tough choices about safe, about sex. Um, sex education is a parent's responsibility by reinforcing and uh, supplementing what your teens are learning in school. Um, so that you can set up a stage for a lifetime of um, uh, healthy sexuality. So I am a health educator and I my main priority or my main focus is to go around um, to different schools between the Bronx and Manhattan. And I teach off a base of a curriculum called Be Proud, Be Responsible. Um, I love my job. I, I love uh, talking sex education, especially because I felt that when I had sex education in my school, it wasn't really the best. Also, my mom, uh, to talk about that, my mom wasn't the, well, my mom wasn't really comfortable talking about it as well. And so ironically, this is what I do as a full-time job right now. It's just like, I love teaching and I love keeping um, adolescents safe and uh, aware of the choices that they can make for a healthy lifestyle. So uh, sex is a staple subject of news, entertainment, and advertising. Um, if you wait for the perfect moment, you might miss the best opportunities, okay? Um, think sex education as an ongoing conversation. So this conversation is a—it's never an easy one to have, um, especially with uh, the changing in times, um, with sex being so um, media focused or or in, on ads. You know, just the smallest type of things um, kind of deliver a, a message, and you know, parents right should be. Uh, sort of that that anchor that lifeline to just talk to um our adolescents just so that we can have perfect communication in making healthy decisions so we're going to start off with puberty right um puberty is a time of change from child to adult it is when the body reaches maturity right and it is when emotional changes occur uh, the bodies of uh, males and females become um, fertile. So in order to understand how to talk to our youth, we need to understand how the body works. And sometimes we need to, you know, just kind of reverse um, in that time and think about, okay, so what, what was going on? What's going on with either 
you know, my body, what's going on with my emotions, all right? So we need to understand where they're coming from with this. So being fertile means that, you know, boys at the start of puberty will start to produce sperm and females are born with half-formed eggs called ova. During puberty, uh, one will be released once, uh, fully formed uh, ova will be released once a month, all right? And these are the necessary things. One sperm cell needs an ova to create a new baby. So when does puberty start? So the age, age ranges, right? So for males, it can be from anywhere from 10 to 15, uh, females eight to 14, everyone is different. They will start and finish uh, on their own pace or their own time, and this is normal. The pituitary gland is what starts uh, the signals for boys and girls uh, to start puberty, right? It's the kind of like the key to the car that starts the, you know, the, the, the engine. So the pituitary gland is what sends the hormones to start puberty. And for females and males, uh, the pituitary gland in females will send the signal to the ovaries to produce estrogen. For males, the pituitary gland will send signals to produce testosterone. These leads to physical changes, right? So uh, for the changes that happen in the female body, growing taller, bones grow, hips get wider and curvier, weight gain is normal, pimples, voice gets a little deeper, hair growth um, in the pubic area, armpits, arms, legs, um, breasts and nipples get larger, uh, the body sweats more, the menstruation period starts to begin, and may have some mood swings, sexual thoughts, and feelings. For boys, um, hair growth, pubic area on the arms, armpit space, um, in the uh, may get more hair on their arms, back, chest, uh, voice gets deeper, penis and testicles start to grow, uh, sperm is produced, and may have sexual thoughts and feelings. Also, growing taller, bones grow, muscle grow, weight gain is normal, pimples and body start to sweat more. So we see that during puberty, there's a lot of things that's a similarity uh, for both uh, males and females. The only thing that, that the estrogen will develop certain things that are different and the testosterone will develop certain different uh, as well for the males. We also need to talk about what's really important, the reproductive anatomy. Um, so we're gonna start off with the penis, okay? So here we have the scrotum. So the scrotum has two uh, jobs. It is a temperature regulator, and it also protects the testicles. The testicles here um, produce the sperm, the urethra. It is either where urine or ejaculation um, comes out, and the penis, which is the male organ. Here we have a side view. Again, we start down here at the, at the scrotum. So the scrotum again, temperature regulator and protective shell for the testicles and testes. This long tubing right here is called the vas deferens and it's just used to transport the, um, the matured sperm in the epididymis right here. Um, to transport the mature ep uh, sperm through over so that the they are met by the seminal vesicle right here and the prostate gland. Together they create this thing called semen. Semen protects the um the sperm cell. Okay. So um sperm cells are developed in the testicles after puberty. Um, our average boy will start to make about 290 million sperm cells uh, for the rest of his life. Um, that's about 1,500 sperm cells every second. And over a lifetime, that's uh, 500 billion sperm cells in a lifetime. So, flaccid and erect penis. So, um, if semen is going to come out of the penis, it is most likely to be erect which means that the uh, penis is erect when blood rushes to it 
and mus muscles push the semen into the urethra and out the penis, and this is called ejaculation. Okay? It's one thing to note that when the penis is erect, it can ejaculate, and when the penis is flaccid, it can release urine. Both cannot happen at the same time, and that is because of the prostate gland right here. So the prostate gland actually has um, kind of like an on and off switch. So when the penis is flaccid, urine is able to come out, and when the penis is erect, um, uh, ejaculation is able to come. Now we have the female reproductive system, okay? Uh, we have the, the clitoris, which is used for stimulation, right? The labia minora and majora are the lips that protect the inner works of the vagina, the urethra, okay? Here we have the internal view. Ovaries are where the half-formed eggs are stored, right? So once puberty starts, once a month, a fully formed ova or egg will be released. Um, and that is the cause or the menstruation or the period that's when it will start to begin. In the fallopian tubes, right, we have where the fully formed egg will wait for about three days, okay, so that it can uh, be fertilized. In this region here, the uterus, right, uh, is where the menstruation begins or um, the baby will be formed. Uh, a lot of misinformation that I have heard is that, you know, I often hear people say that women's stomach are developing or, or getting bigger. So the baby is not in the stomach. The baby is in the uterus. But uh, many, many times I've, I've, I would hear someone say, oh, look at, the, you know, the baby is in the stomach and it's getting bigger. Uh, the baby cannot be in the stomach, guys, because um, there's the uh, acid in our stomach, okay? So the cervix, which is the wall of the vagina, so um, the cervix only opens naturally during uh, the release of the menstruation uh, through childbirth, or through fertilization. So when the body recognizes that it needs or that it wants to or that it is able to reproduce, it would open up. But usually the cervix doesn't allow anything um, to pass that point. Okay. And then we have the vagina, the vagina canal, where uh, birth delivery would happen, where the menstruation would happen, and also penetration uh, via penis or um, any devices, uh, it's 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 uh, used for that. This is just a side view of what we just saw. Okay. So now that we have talked about the body, um, as far as puberty goes, as far as anatomy goes, um, because these things are important to know where everything is structured, to know how everything works um, is something that we definitely, you know, we need to, we need to know. Um, if we kind of just speculate and kind of just throw out these kind of these fears of how our body actually works, um, we're going to get some repercussions uh, with that. Uh, we're going to get kind of like that saying where, you know, the, uh, where we kind of invent things that are not really true or positive or even helpful um, to prevent certain things from happening. As of now, does anyone have any questions, comments, concerns um, for the puberty part or the reproductive anatomy part? Okay. Please um let me know if I'm going too fast. Um if you have any questions, um just please let me know and I will answer or slow down. 
Okay. So now we're going to move on to uh, diseases, right? Uh, one of the main parts of why we want to uh, educate our adolescent is to avoid certain things um, like HIV, pregnancy, STDs, um, sex. We need to understand that sex is a thing of life. Um, to talk about it, to enjoy, all right? But they are, there are certain consequences when we're not, when the necessary precautions are not being met, right? And one of the, the consequences could be uh, catching of uh, HIV AIDS, okay? So what do you know, what have you heard um, and all answers are welcome. This is something that I would usually ask my students to see what pre-knowledge they might know or what rumors they might have heard. There's always something going on or there's always these, these chatter, um, especially sometimes when adolescents don't want to talk to their parents. They kind of try and get this information from the internet or from other um adolescents or other youth that they think they might know a lot more. Um, and so a lot of things happen here where um, you get different responses, right? So, so let's talk about sex, right? Um, in order to talk about these diseases, we need to know how they are transmitted from one person to another. So there's three different types. Um, there's oral sex, there's anal sex, and there is um, penetrative sex. These things are very key. Uh, this information is very key to, to understand how these things are transmitted, uh, is that we need to understand sex um, it is, it, in its entirety. Um, a lot of people think that um, oral sex and anal sex are not a type of sex, but they are. And that is because both um, HIV and STIs are, uh, can be transmitted, okay? So when we talk about sex, we need to talk about it in the three physical forms uh, that, it, that they are, okay? Oral, anal, vaginal. And when you explain these things, oral sex is um, a person's mouth on another person's uh, uh, genitals, whether it be penis, vagina, or anus, okay? It's very important to understand that this is a type of sex and that the way that you talk about it and break it down um, will be, a, or will make a major difference, okay? Um, anal sex is a, anal sex is a, um, a penis or device penetrating another person's anus, whether it's male or female, okay? And then we have penetrative sex, which is penis to vagina. These are what, are what I like to call the three physical types of sex. It's important that we have to talk about that, break that down, okay? Along with that, there are four different types of fluid that will lead to the transmission of HIV. So in, the, in this picture, we have breast milk, okay? It's one of the fluids. We have blood. Oh, pardon. We have uh, semen and we have vaginal fluids. These are the four fluids or the four main fluids of transmission. So when we hear these stories, these outlandish stories of how these things get transmitted, a lot of people might think like, oh, if you touch someone or sitting on a seat or eating from someone else's food or you know, using the bathroom, these are all incorrect answers. Um, Again, talking to your adolescents, you need to be straight up. You need to talk to them um, and, and connect on a level where you're not scaring them, but you're providing them with the information that they need in order to continue to move forward. So these are the four main fluids that will lead to the transmission of HIV um, and, and uh, could, and with the damages of HIV can lead to AIDS. So we know that the HIV AIDS is called the human immunodeficiency virus, right? It can spread through sexual acts. Um, it cannot spread through behaviors like shaking hands, huggings or, uh, hugging or kissing. Um, and the virus is known for um, weakening uh, a human's immune system, okay? And if not treated, uh, 
due to the damage caused by HIV, it can then lead to AIDS. Okay, a lot of people think that AIDS and HIV are two separate entities or two separate things, and that you can possibly get AIDS before you get HIV. That is incorrect. Okay, you get HIV, and due, due to the damage caused by the HIV, it will lead. Uh, it will then become AIDS. Okay. AIDS stands for acquired um, acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. Again, and it happens after HIV has already weakened enough the, the immune system, and it can lead to uh, AIDS. This is a re representation, right, of how the T cells, right, uh, the HIV invades the T cell. Um, and it's a, a recurring loop, as we see here. So very important. Um, how is HIV not transmitted? Um, the reason why I also speak heavily on this is uh, we've all have taken trains and public transportation and everything, um, and maybe have encountered someone um, who might have said, you know, uh, you know, can you spare a dollar for, um, I'm looking for, you know, to, to, to have my medication on HIV. Um, and one of the first things that I've always seen when I'm on the train is that the first thing that they try to do is avoid this person because they think they might get this, uh, this virus. Um, but in reality, what happens is that, you know, that, that person might feel some sort of way. They, um, someone with HIV, is someone who is no different other than that they have a virus that they cannot be cured um and because of that it brings a lot of a lot of speculations it brings a lot of things that if we're not sure about we can deliver the wrong message then also to our youth okay so um if someone has hiv and you're shaking hands or um eating with them it's it's not going to be a way of transmission hugs and kisses coughing or sneezing, toilet seats, swimming pools, these are not ways that, that this virus can be transmitted. It is through the three physical ways of sex, which is oral, anal, vaginal, and the four fluids of transmission, which is breast milk, um, blood, vaginal secretion, and semen. Um, attached to semen, I also like to talk about uh, pre-cum, okay? So, Precum is uh, happens when the penis first gets um, erect, okay, and is a fluid to pretty much lubricate the head of the penis. Um, adolescents have this this word, all right, that that or this saying that has been very popular um, around communities or in, or actually in music, which is called the pullout game is strong, um, also known as the withdrawal method. Um, and we also need to talk about the fact that um, pre-cum can be a source of uh, or a way of transmitting HIV virus, the STIs, right? And also being a part of pregnancy. So we need to talk about those things as well, uh, pre-cum as well, uh, because these are things that, that the youth think that if they pull out in time or if they withdraw in time, that nothing will happen, okay? And this is why condom usage, uh, we, we heavily discuss condom usage at all times. Um, and I will bring it up um, later on in the presentation. How can you prevent, or how can you talk to your teens about preventing this HIV virus? Well, abstinence um, is wait to have sex. Um, abstinence, a lot of people think that, um, it's like a, a, a bad thing, it, it's not uh, at all, okay? Waiting to have sex, there's no rush, okay? Using polyurethane condoms uh, correctly every single time you have any type of physical sex, vaginal, anal, or oral sex. Um, talking about injecting drugs um, and not to, right? Never inject drugs or share needles, right? Um, and that's because one of our main fluids of transmission happens to be blood, okay? Uh, testing at least once a year or every six months. If um, 
talking to your adolescents and talking to them and saying, uh, getting tested is the only way to actually figure out um, if someone is infected with anything. You can't go around looking at people's faces and um, seeing if they change colors or or thinking that something might come up. No. Uh, the only 100% sure way to know if anyone has anything is to get tested, okay? And then there are these pills, uh, these PrEP pills, that uh, they're called pre-exposure prophylaxis, and it is a, um, a medicine that is used to help boost the human immune system in order to counteract the HIV virus. This is something that's relative, relatively new in the market, and it is something that's been helping um, those who might have had a sexual encounter with someone who has HIV to prevent having this HIV virus. So I know this is a lot of content as far as, as far as like HIV goes. Does anyone have any questions, comments, concerns? Just want to take a quick second. Okay. So I will continue. So the next topic that we definitely need to be informed of and learn about is STD. Um, same thing. What have our adolescent heard? Uh, what do they know? You know, and when talking to them about this, when breaking them down, all answers are welcome. That's why we are here in this training. That's why we acquire the correct information so that anything that they might have heard, they might have picked up, they might have researched or Google that we answer them correctly, okay? But not just or not just answering them correctly, but making them feel comfortable to come to us, uh, or to come to the parent or the guardian or brother or sister or someone who's there to just talk to them and break this down and be comfortable, okay? Again, let's talk about sex. The three physical ways of con the three physical ways, oral, anal, vaginal, okay? Um, and the four, the, the three physical ways, right? So what does an, uh, STD stand for? The, it is known for sexually transmitted disease, not stop that disease or um, selective transmitted diseases or spot the difference, okay? It is called sexually transmitted disease. Um, it is now also known as STI, sexually transmitted infection. And um, STD was more of a term used in the past, and the CDC has been working to kind of change uh, the standing is in more into STI, because in order for this uh, sexually transmitted infection to actually be transmitted to another person, one must be infected with it, okay? So it doesn't just come out of nowhere. Um, it doesn't it live on the surfaces or anything of that nature. It is infected, all right? And it is infected and it is transmitted by any of the three physical ways, which is oral, anal, vaginal, right? And the four, phys the four fluids of transmission. So again, we have sexually transmitted disease uh, or infection, right? It is spread from person to person. Uh, it, it's common, okay? It can be asymptomatic. Um, and most STIs are easily treatable, okay? There's three different types of STIs, all right? There is bacterial, uh, which are curable with medicine, okay? If detected on time, so again, um, I mentioned when talking about HIV that testing is a number one. Um, and when testing for a STIs, that is the only way that you will know if you have an STI. Um, so they are, the bacterial STIs are 100% curable if detected on time. So they include chlamydia, gonorrhea, and syphilis, okay? The viral STDs are not curable, but they are... Um, manageable with with medication um and notice that 
anything that's a viral STI or H, uh, STD starts with the letter H. So herpes, um, HIV, hepatitis B, HPV, which stands for the human papillomavirus, these are not curable, okay? Um, but they are treatable. And then we have parasitical, right? Uh, or parasites. These STDs are curable, um, and some of them may include like trichomoniasis, uh, pubic lice, okay? So these can be treatable, but again, these can only be treated if they are detected. Uh, I did say that these are asymptomatic. So one of the main symptoms of STIs is that they can actually show no symptoms at all, all right? And someone can definitely just be a carrier. And again, the only way that you would know if someone has anything is getting tested. So testing is definitely something that you always want to mention, you always want to talk about, okay? Uh, again, we have the viruses, the bacteria, and the parasites, the different types uh, that are in the STI uh, umbrella. So some symptoms uh, can be uh, burning when urination, sores, blisters, bumps, warts, pimples near the mouth or genital area, unusual discharge from the penis or vagina. So uh, with unusual discharge, it might be uh, like yellow or, or um, gray or not, it, it, sh it shouldn't be, uh, it shouldn't look any other color coming out of the body. Rashes, itching in the genital area, frequent urination, abdominal pain, and in many cases, like I said, no symptoms whatsoever. How can you prevent STI? Again, abstinence, um, using condoms, never injecting drugs or sharing needles, and testing at least once a year or every six months, perfectly fine. Um, I also talk about pregnancy, uh, or you want to talk about pregnancy with your adolescent. You want to break down on, you know, what is it? How does it happen? And what are some negative consequences of getting pregnant early? Um, I did have a video, um, and if we have time, I will share it at the end. Um, but I still have a couple contacts of uh, content of how uh, of, to go through. If anything, I will share the video in the link and you guys can um, just watch it from home. Um, I will also provide certain uh, websites in which you guys can also um, work with your adolescents or do independent research or do research with your adolescent together. So consequences that I like to talk about when, when talking about pregnancy. Um, so we all know that pregnancy happens when the penis penetrates the vagina, right? When there's ejaculation, uh, the sperm cells meets the ova in the fallopian tube. Um, the, it then drops down into the uterus, okay? And this can happen in a matter of uh, four to five days. Um, uh, pregnancy is not a, a, a something that happens right, you know, right away. Um, so when talking about your team, you know, you want to talk about education and getting pregnant early with when it comes to education. So in our classroom, I like to uh, show this video, um, which is called Tanisha and Shay. It's a video about these two teens um, who are athletes and they are also in a relationship. And they find out, you know, that the young lady gets pregnant and it kind of, um, she kind of struggles to figure out how she's going to complete her education. She finds out that her boyfriend was accepted to college and, you know, how she's going to handle this information or, or in, in vice versa. You know, um, it, it didn't show the perspective of the male uh, part, but we also have to think about, you know, when there is a child involved, you know, how is the, and at an early age or at a young age as an adolescent, how will you finish education? Financial. Uh, we know that babies are not, um, you know, it's expensive to have these different types of things, to provide food, to provide clothing. 
Um, these are things that, you know, how will an adolescent gain these things if they have, you know, no education to properly get a, a proper job, you know? It might affect relationships. These are teen pregnancy um, between the couple, between parents, um, living situation uh, is definitely a consequence of maybe teen, pre of teen pregnancy. Pardon. Um, the living situation, you know, where are they going to live? How are they going to sustain that? You know, um, again, these are not easy uh, situations. Um, cost to keep the child as far as, you know, clothing, food goes, um, living situation, and having a job. Um, as a teen, how is a teen going to provide for a, a child if, you know, they don't have the experience or the education to um, have, you know, to move forward in life and to provide for the child as how one's supposed to or could Supposed. When talking about this again, how to prevent? Um, pro, pro, <laughs> pardon me. It's it's uh it's supposed to say how to prevent uh pregnancy. And again, we talk about abstinence, um, waiting to have sex, using latex condom correctly every single time. All right, any single time, um, uh, either with vaginal, anal, or oral sex. And um, talking about birth control, um, there's different types of birth control, and I'll jump into it. Birth control is something that um, you might want to do research together to kind of research, um, and, and and it's educating also the males as well, just to know how they work. Um, a birth control method for males is the condom. Okay, um, there are such methods as, um, or with, with the condom, pardon me, but the condom is something that you want to break down and maybe you want to look up a video on how to properly put on a condom or um, just, just having the conversation of, you know, do you know what a condom is and how does it work? And, you know, these are things that you want to talk about when you're talking about birth control but everyone should know about birth control. Everyone should have knowledge about birth control. Um, so it works literally by uh, stopping uh, fertilization, okay? So these, these birth control work by stopping fertilization. And when I talk about these birth control, uh, these are the um, uh, girls or the women or female types of birth control, okay? So I'm gonna work my way from up all the way down, working at a hundred percent abstinence. Right? It is the choice to not have sex. It is a hundred percent effective in preventing pregnancy and any type of infection, whether it be HIV or any of the STIs. It this comes at a hundred percent. LARC is known as the as the uh, long acting reversible contraceptive. Uh, this is a LARC. This is called the implant. It is a clinic visit needed, over 99% effective, can last up to four years, and it's a small rod that is inserted uh, in a woman's upper arm, all right? And it, uh, it's artificial hormone to prevent uh, birth. Another LARC gear we see is the IUD. So it is known as the internal uterine device, right? Uh, clinic visit needed, 99% effective, um, it can last from three to six years, depending the size of the uterus. Um, it will provide or have three different types of uh, IUDs, right? Which we have the uh, Mirena, the Skyla, and the Lilita. Uh, all different sizes, depending on the sizes of, of, the, of the uterus. Um, yes, awesome. We have another IUD, which is called the copper IUD. Uh, again, clinic visit needed, 99%. Lasts up to 12 years. So this one's different than the other ones. Uh, the copper IUD has no artificial hormones whatsoever. Um, it, the copper uh, uh, pretty much acts like a shield or it makes the uterus kind of uh, inhabitable for sperm to live in. 
Um, and that's why it's actually, it can last a lot longer than the other two displayed before. None of these stop uh, STIs and none of these stop HIV, okay? These are just birth control. Uh, again, important to just point out because uh, there's a misconception that I've heard before where people think that, you know, um, birth control can stop everything. Um, and, it's, and it's literally in the name, it's birth control. Okay. Um, moving on from the larks, now we have the depo or the shot. It is prescription needed. Ninety-four percent effective for typical use and can last up to three months. This is literally a straight shot of hormone injected into the uh, female's body, and it is there for three months. The other ones. Um, the, the previous three that I have shown are reversible contraceptions, so they can literally be removed anytime before their time is due. With the depot here, um, it cannot be removed. So once it is in the body, it is in the body for the next three months, and it takes three months to dissolve. It, it can be injected up to four times in a year. The vaginal uh, ring or the ring is prescription needed. So this can be obtained uh, from your doctor and you can uh, purchase it in your local or get it from your local uh, pharmacy, Rite Aid, Walgreens, okay? 91% uh, effective, can be replaced every month. And it's a flexible piece um, that is inserted into the vagina and it's, and it's left there uh, for three weeks. So three weeks it will be inserted. On the fourth week, the menstruation will come, uh, but by then the vaginal ring will have been removed, discarded, thrown away, right? The menstruation will then come on the fourth week, and on the fifth week, a new, or the following month, would be a new ring that would be attached. The patch. Uh, prescription needed, 91% effective. Uh, it is replaced every week. Um, it has designated areas in which it needs to be placed. It just cannot be placed anywhere, all right? It needs to be placed in designated areas, as you see here, is above the bikini line. Um, this is one of the main, uh, or this is the only birth control method that is absorbed from the skin, from, so from in the body, okay? Um, it is waterproof, okay? So... Um, and again, it is replaced every single week. Uh, the pill, uh, prescription needed, 91% effective. Uh, it's a combination of um, estrogen and progestin. And this is taken every single day orally. Um, and the reason why it's taken every single day is because every pill uh, has enough hormones for 24 hours. Um, a big, a big mis uh, or a big, mi mi uh, excuse me, a big miscongestion that I get from uh, my adolescent students is that you know this only works if you only have sex. So once you're gonna have sex, then you take it, um, and that is totally incorrect. Um, when I talk to my, you know, my students, um, I talk about the pill being an everyday thing. It needs to be taken every single day at the exact same time or the around same time because this is not something that works right away. Um, with all the methods that I've talked about being hormonal methods, um, anything that is a hormonal method takes about 28 days to effectively work within the female's body to prevent birth, right? The only method that works or can work immediately is the copper IUD. That is the only method that works um, right away. Everything else takes about 28 days. Um, so something that you wanna talk about is that condom usage with birth control is a, an effective method to prevent pregnancy along with STIs and HIV, which we talk about condoms here, right? So no prescription needed. Um, you can either buy them in the, you know, you can talk about them being sold at 
you know, the Walgreens or Walmart or, or any type of uh, convenience store, or they are, you know, free at any clinic, they're 92 to 97% effective. And that is with effective usage. So meaning knowing every single method of how to put on a condom. Um, I typically do a condom demonstration um, on how to actually uh, put the condom on the penis. There's um, 12 steps to putting on a condom. Um, and I will actually send that information or um, so that you guys can actually look up how to uh, properly put on a condom. Um, and again, when it comes to condom usage, I feel like everyone should know how to handle or how to use a condom or even to know information about condoms. Um, and also we have the female condom. No prescription needed, 79% effective, used every single time um, sex happens. Um, this method is uh, not one that is being, well, the female condom is not one that it's actually, uh, it's not sold uh, in a lot of places, so the demand is pretty low, um, but certain clinics do have them. Um, and again, with these types of methods, if you're using a female condom, you do not use a male condom, and if you use a male condom, you do not use a female condom. Uh, both condoms will rub on each other and create friction. And these friction will then um, cause the condom to break. So um, here are some tips, right? Seize the moment. Um, when a TV program or video rises issue, uh, issuing about uh, responsible sexual behavior, use it as a springboard for discussion. Remember that everyday moments such as you know, riding in the car, riding on a car, or putting away groceries sometimes offer the best opportunity to talk. So seize the moment. If you see something that you know, if you find a condom, or or you know, you feel like your teen is uh, thinking about something or watching something, you know, seize that moment. Take that opportunity to talk. Um, be honest. If you're uncomfortable, say so. Um, but explain that it is important to keep talking, right? If you don't want to answer, uh, if you do not, if you do not know how to answer your team's questions, offer them to find answers uh, for them to look up together. Like I said, so there are many different websites. There is amaze.org. Um, there's Planned Parenthood. Um, there is um, different types of. Uh, websites in which you can use up, use to find this information that you need, um, especially when breaking down different types of um, STIs, pregnancy, um, birth control methods, okay? Um, be direct. Clearly state your feelings about the specific issues such as oral sex or intercourse. Uh, present the risk. Um, include uh, emotional pain sexually transmitted disease, unplanned, unplanned, pregnancy, unplanned pregnancy, right? Explain that oral sex isn't a uh, risk-free alternative to intercourse, all right? Um, so seizing the moment, being honest, be direct. Consider your team's point of view. Don't lecture your team or rely on scare tactics to discourage um, sexual act uh, activity. Instead, listen carefully, understand your team's uh, pressures, challenges, and concerns. Um, move beyond the facts. So your team needs to accurately be informed about sex. Um, but it is just as important to talk about feelings, attitudes, values, examine questions on ethics and responsibility in your context of personal or religious belief. Um, Invite more discussion. Let um let your team know that it's okay to talk to you. Um, whenever he or she uh has questions or concerns, um, reward them by saying, you know, I'm glad you came to me. Um, this again, this subject is it's a lot. It's a lot of information. Um, and sometimes we might not be very comfortable talking to our team. Um, 
but let's try. You know, let's try. And if we're not even that comfortable, let's use stuff or let's use technology to um, move forward in helping bridge that gap together um, so that it makes it easier to talk about. Um, one of the main things that I've learned is, you know, yes, definitely be honest, definitely be correct um, about the information because you don't want to use scare tactics. Um, they don't work. They, they definitely do not work. So I know that we're a little like four minutes over. Um, I wanted to know if anyone had any questions, any comments, concern um, about the presentation. Okay, guys. Well, it doesn't seem like anyone have any has any questions of any sort. Um, I hope this was very informative for you today. Um, and oh, we have questions. Oh, sorry, I don't know why my question didn't come on exactly the way I wanted it. But the thing is, the transmitted thing, the STD or STI, yeah. I think it was, that can only be transmitted only if you're like um, intercoursing, right? Yes. So intercourse, and remember, when we talk about intercourse, you have to break it down through the three physical types. So anal, oral, vaginal, right? And the four uh -huh. fluids of transmission, um, breast milk, blood, um, vaginal secretion, semen, and pre -cum. Okay, okay, yeah, so these, that's the, it's the only way. So if a, if someone has not had any type of intercourse whatsoever, uh, meaning oral, anal, or vaginal, then yes, these types of uh, STIs, STDs cannot be transmitted over. Okay, got it. No worries. And thank you. You're welcome. It was very good. Thank you very much. Oh, you're very welcome. Um. <laughs> I know it's a lot of information, guys. Like I said, uh, I've been doing this now for about eight years. Um, and when I started talking to teens, um, it was a bit uncomfortable for me because I, you know, I grew up, you know, uh, helping other kids uh, in, in camps and stuff like that. And, and the last thing you want to think about is that, you know, these things are on their minds. But um if they're on their minds, it's better to talk about it in a correct fashion so that they make healthy decisions. Um, and so they are informed so that they can avoid, you know, these types of consequences as, you know, being pregnant at a young age or having an uncurable disease as HIV or um, being affected by STDs and STIs. Um, it hasn't been, yes, it wasn't easy for me at first, but now, you know, I love it because I get to um, inspire the youth and talk to the adolescents uh, on making healthy decisions. On top, um, I, I love to talk about, you know, you know, um, finishing up one's education and talking about travel and stuff like that. And uh, these things can't happen if, like, you're a teen. So guys, um, does anyone have any other questions or comments, concerns? Well, if not, thank you all so much for attending. Um, I'm gonna quickly, uh, I will send out uh, some other follow-up PSS resources. And if you haven't already, Make sure that you fill out the census now more than ever. All right. Thank you all so much for attending. Uh, thank you so much to our presenter. Thank and, you. And uh, check out PSS Life U for more informative webinars like this. All right. Thanks, guys. Have a great day, guys.